I've spent about 25 years in technology, first as the editor of PC Magazine, launched Family PC, and today I write about raising kids in a digital world and what that means. I write, do television, I'm a spokesperson, and consult for companies. Okay, great. So is, is kids and technology your, sort of your focus now? Yeah. Okay. And, and really, what all these tools that we have, what are the ramifications of living with them? Because they change everything. What do you think the future of kids and, kids and technology is? When I put on um, my sort of cautionary tale self um, and I look at the wonderful tools we've given people, we've given them tools and let them go play and now we're seeing some of the effects and some of the effects are not so great. And I'll give you an example, just burning a CD. We just gave everybody, if you remember, the motto was rip and burn, rip and burn. Well, a couple of years later, we saying, hey, we don't really want you to just rip and burn everything. Those, are, those people that own the content aren't going to give this to us anymore. As a matter of fact, I believe HDTV is being held up, you know, um, because of policy, because of not being able to get the content from the providers, because we've seen what happened with music. So we realized after the fact, just giving people tools without the education that they need to use them responsibly is a problem. The same with social networking. Our children are spending tons of time on places like MySpace and Friendster and Facebook um, without realizing some of the implications of what they do. Harming another friend, libeling a teacher, um, giving out information that they shouldn't, being pawns in a game that's larger than themselves. It's almost that when you go on to a social network online, you feel that same way that you do when you walk onto a college campus. Hey, this is a free zone, anything goes. There's nobody here that's going to make me um, look at the ramifications of what I'm doing. And I think that we need to build in, right into the software that create, we create and the hardware that we create, incentives and rewards and constructs for having people rewarded for doing the right thing and for making good decisions, and we haven't done that. What are some examples of those reward systems? Well, look at eBay. How do you know that somebody's a good buyer on eBay or a good seller? Well, you rate them. You know if you get glasses. And yeah. So you have feedback and you know that you know something about the person. When should a system, at some point, anonymity is great on the internet, it's one of the pillars of the internet, but at some point, if you want to know who somebody is and they're willing to tell you and it's consensual, should that be allowed? I think so. And I think that would go a long way in establishing trust. How do you teach children the difference between low value relationships and high value relationships? So they don't say, I have 175,000 buddies. I'm so popular when they really have no friends. They really don't understand that distinction and systems can be built in. So you rank your buddies and, and the ones that are your really close friends that you've touched and felt versus casual acquaintances. I think that we've got to take the same social constructs that have worked so well. Um, policing each other, um, rewarding each other, and build them into the tools that we use on the web. So you mentioned you know, social networks have become bigger lately. I was on Facebook when you came in the room. Are these... Well, interesting, Facebook, 40% of the kids are putting their room, their dorm numbers and their phone numbers. And I know advertisers, and that's the easiest crowd, are looking at it, never mind the pedophiles or the thieves or whoever else is looking at it. The other thing, I, I think that's you know, a social thing. There are also things that are fundamentally shaping the graduates that are coming out of school. One is, I'll call it the cut and paste generation. The first thing you learn when you get your computer is how to cut and paste. And I think that if you look historically, look at the Jason Blairs, look at the Rick Brads, look at the Stephen Glasses, email plays a big part in all those stories and the internet and separating what I've really done and researched as a reporter to what I've gathered on the internet. When you start your gathering on the internet with no premise, with no hypotheses, you tend to take the easy way out and cobble together a, um, something that doesn't involve very much creative thinking. So has the cut and paste generation made creativity something that's not particularly valued or rewarded? Is that going to get worse as time goes on? I think so. If you look at corporations, so you, I gave you an example of journalism. So look at corporations, Enron, Imclone, Martha Stewart, Ron Perlman, all of the recent corporate scandals, if you will, and there have been many of them, have been a breakdown caused to a large part by the role of email 
in the company. So unless your employees know, and by the way, companies report losing about $3 billion a year due to improper internet surfing, people wasting their time. Unless your employees start to know, when do you, how do you make a good decision? It's not often a one-tool decision. You can't run your business by email alone. You can't go to work in the morning at 9, come out at 5, and all you've done is email. And you're seeing that. And you're seeing people not only do email, but not go back in the audit trail to understand how they got to a decision. You're seeing a BlackBerry decision, I'll call it. You get, a, you get something on your BlackBerry that says, yes, sell it. And you know this person is probably driving, listening to music, doing 500 other things, and not attending to the audit trail, the history of what led to that decision. So I think the smart person in the future is going to have to know how to use each communication tool at the right moment to make the best decision. And it's not just the tool they want, but to understand how the other person likes to communicate and say, whoa, well, maybe we should meet now face to face and resolve this. And so mastering the tools is huge, and nobody's paying attention to it. What needs to be done to get people to pay attention to it? I think some of the things you can do, in schools in particular, is, um, first of all, I think that the industry has a responsibility not to get, just give out tools. And I'd love to see them tie the portion of their revenue to education. Let's, 0.5% of all industry revenues go to developing education platforms. Two, I'd love to see the schools do something like a graduated internet license. So then you're six years old, this is your internet world, your five URLs and the five people that you write to. And as you show mastery, and it doesn't have to be age dependent, you graduate to bigger levels. That implies filtering out some tools, and we know that filtering things out is always more expensive and more difficult than letting everything in, but I think it has to happen. So a graduated internet driver's license, if you will, I think is kind of important. And then I think schools can use models. Kids love talking about their experiences on the web and what they do, so let's codify them somehow. Let's have mock trials about ethics. If you die, who gets your emails? Um, and there have been many instances where kids have actually committed suicide and that's now being, it's now in the courts. Um, if there's a phishing site, how can you tell the difference between the real thing and not? They're clues. How do we know? Let's have a mock trial deciding if Johnny can accused Teddy online of stealing his iPod. Is that libel or not? We're not asking these questions. The teachers aren't using RSS feeds. They're not using um, blogging in their classrooms and until they do, they can't teach about it. Yeah. So there's got to be that incentive as well. Do you, think it, do you think that is going to happen? Is that going to be integrated into the school? I do. I think in five years, just about every teacher who has um, come through um, the school system will have been raised on these tools. What they haven't been raised on is how to think about using these tools. So we're going to miss a generation. We've lost a generation. We, we do have it, one whole generation that cares not about privacy or about plagiarism or about piracy. And we're going to have to wait until the next generation comes up now. Um, they're about 8 to 12 years old now. They're um, very socially motivated. They want to do good things. They want to ask these questions. And so it's going to take a while to, we've given them the tools, and now where we are at this moment is, now let's have the discussion we need to have about how to use these tools the right way and not the wrong way. And it's not malicious. They're not looking to be mean or fraudulent or even break the law. They just don't know. I, I like Bruce Springsteen. I'm going to take his song. I mean, it's just, it's not a whole lot of thinking. Privacy, who cares? I'll trade it for a date with some you know, online rock star. And so I think it's just a matter of being asked the question and forcing them to come up with an answer. As far as technology goes, what, what, what all is in store for education? Um, edu education, the great thing is we're past the, that initial, let's get the schools wired and let's get technology in the schools. And by the way, E-rate went a long way to doing that. And that really was a tithe of a business tax, you know. So another thing I think is perhaps online retailers might be so gracious as to give a percentage of their um, non-taxable sales to um, education. So I think the schools now have these tools and now it's a matter of learning to use them. I think what teachers and schools aren't seeing is the power of the non PC thing and they're starting to fret about children walking into classes with 
graphing calculators that also can house all their Spanish words for the test, um, PDAs, cell phones, what are the rules about cell phones in my class, text messages. Um, <clears throat> they're very frightened of technology that's not wired and out there in the open and can leave the classroom with the child. And they're, again, they're not using it in creative ways. I mean, what more fun thing could there be to have an educational scavenger hunt using your PDA? And when GPS comes into all these handheld devices and you can identify who else within a five mile radius is reading Chaucer at this very moment, um, it, it could be f fabulous. So I think there's great potential, but they've got to start immersing themselves in using the tools and thinking about how they're going to use them. What haven't we talked about that's important to know? Um, I sound like such a pessimist. Um, um, I think piracy, plagiarism. Um, no, I, th I, think, I think I'm good. Okay. Can you? I mean, one thing I wanted to ask, I mean, my mom is a school teacher and we've had a computer in the house as almost as long as I can remember. Oh, wait, there's and she still doesn't have a clue how to use it. Yeah. How, how does she teach technology? Yeah. Well, I think part of what happens is that teaching becomes a different kind of thing. You've got to empower students to be teachers, to want to tell their teachers how to do something, to make it a collaborative lesson, that whole notion of the teacher as facilitator. I think at the point most schools are at now, it's still pretty primitive. Um, they do what a computer's always been good at, which is, you go into a teacher's meeting and the teacher says to you, Johnny's not good at math, and you have no idea what that means. You talk to a computer and the computer says, Johnny's not good at math. <clears throat> he doesn't understand fractions and decimals. A computer can be very granular about the individual performance of a student. And in fact, the only conclusive thing we can say about the benefits of technology in school today are that they help children who um, are either from lower socioeconomic areas or have mental challenges of one sort or another. They're very good at that. Whether they amplify the intelligence of the average creative kid is really hard to say. There's been very little research done. We know scores aren't better than they, they've ever been. We know that we rank globally somewhere like ninth or tenth place, depending who's counting what discipline, and we're falling, not rising. So we spent all this money into the technology. If I were a policymaker or you know, a legislator, I'd say, okay, show me what it's done. And I think we're going to be asked to quantify and measure some of this. So the great thing about computers that I think teachers don't understand is that it can take a lot of the diagnostics out of education. You, don't, you can't possibly have 30 kids in your class and know which part of math Johnny doesn't understand. The computer can do that. Then it's up to the teacher to motivate, to help create the individual instruction plan using technology. And so I think there's this great potential um, to get kids to catch up, to catch up quickly, to be on an equal footing quickly, to understand the one thing they were missing. Was it taught to them wrong? Should I try another way? Computers are going to be killer at that. And we've just got to do more research. And in this political climate, we're not doing the research we should because we don't have the funds. Anything else you want to say? Good luck editing it. <laughs> this has been very interesting. It's been great. It just gave you, that's pretty much what I'm going to say in there, if I can get it together. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a really, for these guys, I think it's just critical. Um, and, um, you know, I think kind of a wake up. Um, so we'll see.